the other cars come pulling up alongside. Going through on another crossing where it was right over the bonnet. Look at him now, it's a thunderbird where the rum comes from. We're off again. The horror section, that was just round about Goldman, wasn't it? On one Queensland stretch, there are 128 creek crossings in 144 miles, as well as 32 wooden cattle grids, mostly in poor condition. The Han Highway gives no indication of actually being a highway along any of its 300 miles. The road, when you can find it, consists of two wheel tracks separated by grass up to four feet high. Those were the words co-organiser Norm Pleasance used to describe the conditions drivers could expect for the 1955 Red X Round Australia trial. But really, he could have been talking about any of the three big trials of 1953, 54 and 55. Today you wouldn't want to do this in anything other than a luxury four-wheel drive vehicle. But back then, such vehicles didn't exist. Despite the lack of luxury, 2,000 or more people clamoured to be involved. Little did they know that the Red X trials would go down in history as one of the greatest adventures of the 20th century. They came at a time when motor racing was recovering from the effects of the Second World War. So when the first ad appeared in 1953 calling for entries, the response was immediate. It was huge and everybody was excited about it. Enthusiasm was high. Hundreds of teams immediately enrolled. They were the brainchild of Red Shepherd, an Englishman on a mission who brought Red X to Australia in 1949. Arriving with his wife and the Red X franchise for Australia, New Zealand and New Guinea, they moved into a camping ground. The locals were impressed with the performance of Red X and he was offered a thousand pounds to start a company. Not long after, it became a household name. Up go petrol prices. But down goes your petrol bill when your garage adds Red X to your engine oil at every change. You save at least five pence a gallon on petrol when Red X cuts friction with five exclusive ingredients. Next oil change, remember... Don't forget the Red X. As a marketing ploy, Shepard masterminded the Red X reliability round Australia trials. He teamed up with the Australian Sporting Car Club and together with Norm Pleasance, co-organised the trials. The very first ones were short distances of around 1,600 miles, but it was the big one in 1953 that really caught the nation's attention. It was the longest trial since the New York to Paris of 1908, which was 20,000 miles across two developed continents. This one was only 6,500 miles, but it was into Australia's outback. So what, you might ask? Nowadays, we can head off into the outback any time we like. It's no big deal. In fact, if you never, never go, you'll never, never know. Well, in 1953, in Australia, it was a big deal. No one but no one drove a standard passenger vehicle into Australia's vast unknown. You had to be totally prepared for anything and everything. Plus, being a little crazy help. There were no motels, no petrol, and for most part, no roads. Well, not what your average driver would recognise as roads. The idea of the trial was to put ordinary, everyday passenger cars to the test. So, they sent them on stressful, long-distance treks over torturous terrain. The rules and regulations associated with the trial did not allow for speeding. This wasn't a race. In those days, most speedos went up to 100 miles an hour. The speed limit was around 55 miles an hour on highways and 30 miles an hour in build-up areas. Just so you know, I'll be sticking to mileages rather than kilometres, so remember to multiply by 1.61 to convert to metric. When surveying the route, organised device schedules speeds based on local conditions, and according to the drivers, they never got it right. Cars could be modified, but no souping up of motors was allowed. Protective measures were encouraged, which included protection of the sump, rhubars and extra petrol tanks. Peter Antill was favourite to win. His knowledge and skill are a byword in the motorsport of Australia. 
His car itself is unique in its preparation. All standard seat fittings changed to allow perfect sleeping accommodation. And there were many other enhancements. Jack Murray recalls what he did to his 39 Chrysler Plymouth. So we reinforced the springs, uh, uh, put a heavier clutch plate, went from a 9 inch to 11 inch clutch. Uh, special tyres, we got those from Dunlop. Uh, the main thing to do with the car, uh, what we found, was clearance. If you had enough clearance, you could go anywhere. The fan belt, it, uh, you get industrial belts, not just ordinary fan belts, an industrial belt. That it would last you, well, uh, twice the distance that you were going to travel. You didn't miss a trick. To make sure these mods were above board, cars were heavily scrutinised two hours prior to being flagged off. Car parts were checked for alterations and conditions, then stamped. Any repairs needed along the way had to be made in running time before arriving at the control point. This caused drivers to exceed the scheduled speed to get to the next town in plenty of time to fix what was broken. Though organisers discouraged speeding, there was little that they could do about it. After scrutineering, each car was allotted a score sheet which was checked off at control points. Scores went down one point per minute for early or late arrival. 100 points off for a replaced part, or for disobeying an official order, or even worse, disqualification. And if you didn't lose any points, you were called a clean sheeter or a clean skin. And part of the plan for the other drivers was to help rid you of this curse. All in good fun, of course. The winners were determined by this point system. The teams with the least points on their score were the outright winners. So, on August 30, 1953, 192 cars and their crews gathered at Sydney's Moor Park. The teams were made up of either seasoned professionals, people like Peter Antill, an experienced trials driver who was tipped to win this one. Bill McLaughlin, also an experienced trials driver, well known for his colourful language and innovation with vehicles. Tommy Sawman, who'd been in the motorsport game most of his life. Lex Davison, a wealthy manufacturer who competed in Monte Carlo and Jack Murray, superb sportsman and infamous larrigan. The other side saw the privateers ready for an adventure of a lifetime. As the whole nation watched and followed their trials and terrors, some of these people were to become household names for 14 days in 1953. Cheered on by a 50,000 strong crowd, the competitors were flagged off at three minute intervals. Right on starting time, and there goes the first car, pushing through a mass of people, lining the route for miles. More than 200,000 saw the car set out, and just as many will see them return, or those that do return. Of course, everyone had to wait until all the stragglers were in. All vehicles were checked over, and all protests had to be heard before Tubman and Marshall were declared the outright winners. When the announcement was made, they received a thousand pounds cash and a new car each. Tubman extolled the virtues of the mostly unknown Peugeot and its suitability for Australian conditions. The pair had done nothing to the car to prepare it, except protect the petrol tank. Eleven Peugeots were entered and all finished the trial. Tubman and Marshall were popular winners. Besides being a private entry, they were as surprised as anyone that they had won. That the trial had consisted of many trade entries was a great bone of contention for the private entries who had to scuttle for whatever they needed. Tubman and Marshall hadn't given themselves a chance in hell of winning and claimed they got all the lucky breaks. I have great pleasure in presenting the £1,000 to Mr Tubman and Mr Marshall. And that was it. The longest and toughest round Australia trial ever was over. Red Shepherd announced there wouldn't be any more trials. For him, it was clear they'd served their purpose, to firmly establish Red X as a household name. But there was more to the Red X trials than an elaborate marketing ploy. The sense of danger, the endurance of crews and cars on show at every turn, fueled a nation with excitement and then some. 
The Red X trials fueled the need for change and innovation. They highlighted the need for cars to be made tougher for Australia's conditions. Later, there were other similar trials. Ampol, Mobile Gas, but they never really caught the imagination of the nation like Red X. So unashamedly tough, ambitious and emotionally demanding were the Red X trials that they went on to inspire Hollywood. You've seen or heard of the Cannonball Run film starring Burt Reynolds? Unknown to many, they took their cue from the Australian Red X trials. What shines most from each of the Red X trials is the spirit of adventure, no matter how physical or emotional the cost. For everyone who participated, the trials weren't just about the thrill of a ride. In their bones, they felt the thrill of accomplishing what had never been accomplished before or since because, sadly for us, there can never be another trial like Red X again.